So the mass density rho is going to be the mass over the total area of the plate, which is the width times the, the height. So it's going to be 2a times 2b, so that's going to be 4ab. And it's the same as the mass density of each rod, delta m over delta a. So that gives me access to delta m. It's going to be rho delta a. So it's going to be m over 4ab times delta a, which is 2b delta x. So I'm left with m over 2a delta x. Right, the 2b cancel out. Yeah. Okay. So now I know the mass of a rod. So now, what about the moment of inertia of the rod? So remember, my plate is rotating about z here. So the rod, maybe I just recall here, the rod is away from the axis of rotation. The rod is here at distance x. So I'm going to use, well, I know I'm going to use the parallel axis theorem. I know the moment of inertia of a rod rotating about its axis. I know it here. And so if I'm at distance x, I'm just going to write the parallel axis theorem. Nah. Parallel for the rod. I know that its moment of inertia, iz, is going to be <coughs> The moment of inertia of the rod, so we saw that in the previous lecture, let me see here, there was how was it before that? Here. Uh, one third of m a squared. So in my case, it's going to be one third the mass of the rod delta m times the width of the rod, which is 2b. Oh, sorry, no, half the width, which is b. And then the parallel axis term tells me it's m a squared. So in this case, it's going to be delta m x squared. Yeah, and now to sum all up, I take the limit, I get an integral, and I'm done summing i z is going to be sum of all the rods of this quantity here, one third b squared delta x. Oh, I forgot. I forgot the delta m, sorry, it's not delta x, delta m, and delta m I have it from above, i z, it's going to be m over 2a, one third of b squared plus x squared delta x. And now I know that if I take the limit, I'm going to get an integral. The integral I'm integrating from minus a to plus a. 
and spanning the entire plate. And now I know how to integrate this. What's the integral of one third of b squared? That's the constant, so it's just going to be x. What's the integral of oh, the squared? The integral of x squared. It's one third x cubed, right? Minus a to a. So these are odd functions, so it's going to be twice. I can just write it. So I write it at a, one third, well, a, one third, a cube. And then I write it at minus a, which is going to be minus, minus a, so it's going to be twice this quantity, right? It's going to be a two here and a two here. The twos and the twos are going to cancel out. The a's are going to cancel out. I'm going to end up with iz, m over, Three the a's are gone, and let b squared plus a squared. Makes sense that the two dimensions are included. What's that like? Did I make a mistake? Did I go too fast? All good? Fun, fun exercise, calculus. Okay, let's do another one. <coughs> uniform hollow sphere and uniform solid sphere. Yes, let's do that. We call that the moment of inertia of a uniform ring. Oh, yeah, so we're going to use that to find the moment of inertia of the sphere. We're going to divide it into rings. Remember that a ring is m a squared. We're going to divide the ring sphere into rings at an angle theta to o z. Yeah, and theta goes from zero to pi. Zero to pi. Yeah, that will cover the whole thing. Hmm, I'm having doubts now. Okay, let's try it. So, we start the same area of the ring. What's the area of the ring? This grid. That's the ring. Then it goes around. So this is just like a strip of width. The width is this little arc there that I wrote as a delta theta. And then the perimeter is going to be 2 pi r, where r is the radius of that ring. Yeah, the ring is like this, theta, that's the ring. A is the radius of the sphere, so that radius here is A sine theta. Isn't it? If I do sine theta, I have that length divided by A, yes. So the area is going to be the perimeter 2 pi a sine theta times the width which is a delta theta so that's 2 pi a squared sine theta delta theta okay then the mass density Oh, it's the same. Rho. 
So it's going to be the mass. So this is a hollow sphere, right? So it's going to be the mass divided by the area of the sphere. What's the area of the sphere? It's in the book. Remember now. 4 third of pi r cubed, r cubed, that's the volume. And then if you differentiate that with respect to r, you get 4 pi r squared. That's the area. 4 pi a squared here. And it's the same as delta m over delta a because it's uniform. Same mass density everywhere. So from this, I can deduce the mass of a ring. Delta M rho delta A. So here it's going to be M 4 pi A squared and delta A, I have it up there, 2 pi A squared sine theta delta theta, 2 pi A squared, that simplifies the top and bottom. Sine theta delta theta. Then, oh, so like it. Moment of inertia of a ring. I know it from previous lectures, it's just written there. M A squared. So in that case, it's going to be delta M, and the radius of the sphere of the ring is A sine theta. So I'm going to get m over 2 a a squared, sorry, sine squared, and then delta m is also a sine, so it's going to be sine cubed delta theta. Yeah. Oh, I forgot the square here, sorry. I have to square the A, that gives me the X square. I have to sign, square the sign. By multiplying by another sign, I get sine Q. And now I'm summing up. I take the limit. I'm going to end up with the integral. Summing plus delta theta goes to zero, I'm going to end up with iz equals m over 2 a squared integral from 0 to pi theta d theta. Now, how do I compute this integral? Tricky. Is it tricky? Oh yeah, I'm going to say sine cubed, that's sine squared, yes, sorry, sine squared times sine. And why do I do that? Because sine squared is 1 minus cos squared theta. And then I could see that there's a nice change of variables here. If I call u cos theta, yes, <coughs> that's going to be 1 minus u squared times minus du. Yeah, du d theta is going to be minus sine 
S is going to be minus sine theta. So du is going to be minus sine theta d theta. So sine theta d theta is minus du. And then 1 minus cos theta. Yeah. So I got a nice change of variables here. That will help me compute iz. And we spread over 2 times the integral of 1 minus u squared du. And now, if theta is 0, oh, there's a minus, or am I minus? If theta is 0, then u is 1. And if theta is pi cos pi, that's minus 1. So now I know that I can swap the top and bottom bounds by swapping the sign. Right? Minus the integral from 1 to minus 1 is the integral from minus 1 to 1. And then I know I need to integrate 1 minus u squared. Integral of 1 is u. Integral of u squared u cubed over 3. So I'm getting tight now. That's an odd function, so it's twice the value at 1. 1 minus 1 third, that's 2 third. Multiply by 2, that's going to be 4 third divided by 2. So it's going to be just 2 third m a squared. Nice. Two thirds of m squared. I think that's in the book too. Maybe I'm wrong. Time is it? Half eleven. Time for a break. Man. So we know the moment of inertia of a spherical shell, empty shell. So if we divide the sphere into a stack of spherical shell, thin shells, we can use the previous result. Is a thin shell within the sphere, radius r, thickness delta r, and so volume delta v. What's it going to be? It's going to be thickness times the area. Yes. So the area of the thin shell is 4 pi r squared, and then multiplied by the thickness, I get the volume of this thin spherical shell inside the solid sphere. So now I can compute the mass density for the sphere is m over the volume of the sphere which is 4 third by a cube for this shell, the thin shell it's going to be delta m over delta v so from this, I can reduce the mass of the shell for delta V, delta M equals rho. So this 3, I multiply top and bottom by 3. Rho and delta v, it's above that 4 pi r squared delta r. The 4 pi cancel out, and I'm left with 3 m's over a cube r squared delta r. And now I use my previous result. 
moment of inertia of the shell a bit above or was it here two thirds of m a squared so here it's going to be two thirds of delta m r squared which is two thirds three amps over a cube r squared delta r r squared so the trees cancel out and the r squared regroup okay and now I'm going to sum over all the shells of radius 0 all the way to radius a I'm going to take the limit to get an integral of the sphere so I'm summing up and taking the limit I'm going to end up with 2 m a cube integral from 0 to a r to power 4 dr and I know this integral x to the power n the integral is 1 over n x to the power n plus 1 so here it's going to be n is 4 so it's going to be 1 over 4 r to the power 5 no the it's n over 1 over n plus 1 r to the power n plus 1 so it's 1 over 5 r to the power 5 and so I end up with iz Start now. Equals two fifth of m over a cube times a to the power five. So it's going to be two fifth of m a squared. So a solid sphere, in interestingly, maybe it's not obvious. I guess it's not intuitive. Solid sphere, two-fifth, that's less than two-third, right? If you remember, spherical shell, I said two-third, and we square. So if you have a spherical shell of the same mass, I guess it makes sense. If it's the same mass, all the mass is at distance a, whereas in the sphere, some is at distance a, but then there's a lot of mass at distance smaller than a. So it makes sense. Okay. So, well, now I'm going to switch to the other side to type one. We don't have enough time. Let's read this together then. Equilibrium. A rigid body is said to be in equilibrium if it can remain at rest. Yeah, that's okay. I will expect that, the, like the intuitive notion of equilibrium. There's no motion, no rotation. Yeah. So we saw that for a particle, for uh, a system of particles, you need not only the linear momentum, but also the angular momentum to be zero. And that translates into, since, yeah, we saw that also, since the derivative of the linear momentum is the total force and the derivative of the angular momentum is total torque if they're both zero then total force and total torque is zero so there's, if there's no force applied, no torque applied then there's no, everything is in equilibrium okay
So we saw that earlier, total sum of the force is zero, total moment of the force about an origin is zero. Okay. So it all makes sense. If we do that for gravity, so here we have a rigid body suspended. So say we have an axis here. like this and the body is free to rotate about this axis find the equilibrium position the force acting at gravity mg acting at the center of mass so that's how it's uh, represented that makes sense And the reaction force, so I should use different colors. That's gravity, that's the weight, and then there's the reaction force here, R, and here's the center of mass. So the reaction force is at the point of suspension, and K, okay. Equilibrium. Both total force and total angular momentum um, torque must be zero. So what do we have? Force is R and the weight. The sum must be zero. And then torque, there's only the weight contributing to the torque, right? The reaction force here is applied at O, so the distance between the the action of the force and O is zero, so there's no torque there. Okay, so from the first equation, you could deduce that R is mg. Yeah, and then from the second equation, that RCM is parallel to K. Yeah, the pro cross product of two vectors is zero when the two vectors are parallel. And so you can have two cases. It's parallel in the same direction or it's parallel in the opposite direction. Both are equilibrium, that's true, right? So you could have equilibrium like, like this or equilibrium like that. But one is stable, whereas this one is unstable. And to do that, you need to do study of oscillations and figure out if they're going to Increase in amplitude or decrease in amplitude. Nice the uh, physics I like that. Any questions? So, like I said, 